Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming down to see the, the talk tonight. I'm really very um, uh, honored and happy to introduce uh, Don Bates, who has come all the way from, from Melbourne. Um, Lab Architecture Studio, who he, uh, uh, Don's a founder um, from uh, the mid-90s. Uh, I'm sure you know their office. Um, they're known all over the world. Part of the reason why they're known all over the world is because they are all over the world. They have offices in Melbourne, London, Shanghai, and New Delhi. That's four continents they've got covered. So, Don, did you come from Melbourne? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine what the frequent flyer miles are, but they must be awesome. Don's a professor and the chair at the uh, School of uh, Architecture at the University of Melbourne. He's been the chair since uh, since a year or so. Um, Don's uh, originally from Texas and a graduate from the University of Houston in 1978, and in 83 he studied with uh, Daniel Liebeskind at, at Cranbrook. And if I'm not uh, uh, incorrect, uh, also Jesse Reiser, Ben Nicholson, and, and Carl Chu, names you may know, uh, who all have gone out in their own way to uh, make their mark on, on architecture culture, and I think Don's done it uh, as well, uh, obviously in a much different sort of trajectory and pathway. Uh, uh, Don worked with uh, Daniel Liebeskin in 1986 uh, on the uh, project called City Edge Housing in, in Berlin. It was the first prize winner. And in uh, uh, a few years later, 1989, also working on the Jewish Museum um, in Berlin that uh, Daniel Liebeskin won as his uh, first major uh, project. After a while, uh, Don uh, began lab architecture with Peter Davidson in, in in London, uh, while also teaching at the AA, and a story that may be uh, few, but in a way familiar. Um, architects previously with no major building work uh, put their heads down and fly ideas that they've been working on essentially for probably up until that time 20 years, things that you've probably been thinking about at school in Houston, and they won the competition for Federation Square in Melbourne in 1997. And they promptly, of course, moved to, to uh, Australia to do that work. In, in the same way, uh, only, only nine years earlier, Liebeskin won the Jewish Museum uh, and, and uh, was in Milano and, and uh, in fact, had moved to Los Angeles to teach at UCLA. Uh, little known fact, didn't quite actually get started teaching at UCLA, won the competition, and then moved um, to um, Berlin to carry out the work. This project for Federation Square, you all know it, you've seen it. Uh, it it's, it's a part of uh, kind of the contemporary uh, development of, of uh, architecture since really the age of, on the one hand, Bilbao, the Getty, and so forth, projects that emerged uh, at that time. The sort of Neolithic and the crystalline for uh, my money kind of merge into a, a single project and, and you can almost read this facade along with all of the other urban agendas to bring a, a heart to Melbourne in a variety of different ways. In July 2009, the National Gallery of Victoria presented an exhibition of the kind of career arc of lab and it was entitled Draw the Line. And Don was quoted at that time as saying, there is no architecture without the line. And while that may be obvious, it also refers to, um, or the term draw the line might be the productive act of making work that, as he also said, is independent of software. It has to do with uh, a project of insistence uh, and relentlessness. One could think here at the same time of the Jewish Museum, which uh, Liebeskin called between the lines. And between the lines, he referred to lines that are about organization and relationship. So uh, not only his work, but his, his relationship to, to Liebeskin and, and even before uh, brings about a kind of curious inquiry into the nature and philosophy of lines. We could also think about 
Deleuze and Guattari's uh, project uh, called The Lines of Desire, The Lines of Flight. These are lines that belong to regimes of unconscious thinking. And the line is indeed an anxious line, I think, in the work of Lab. Um, and there are lines that are both intentional and unconscious. And we want to know what Don is thinking and what is in his unconsciousness when he's making these lines. And I think we're about ready to find out. So, welcome, Don Bates. <gasps> something back that they can steal if they're interested, if they're not, then it's okay. Um, so thank you for inviting me and, and for, for this opportunity uh, to be here. Let's see here. I'm going to um, run through a few uh, uh, sort of thematics that emerge in our work over the last, uh, as, as Neil said, we started our office in about 1994. Peter Davidson and I had known each other uh, from when we were both in London in the early 80s. Uh, we were both teaching at the Architectural Association, but we had never talked together. But we had known each other uh, around the school and uh, had uh, co-sponsored some lecture series. And uh, eventually, uh, after I had been in France for four years uh, with an independent school of architecture, then came back to London and we decided to start doing competitions together. Uh, and from that was, was how Lab uh, emerged. And in that, that development, there were a few thematics that have emerged over that uh, period of time. Uh, and some of them quite early. And they've been a kind of resource that we end up going back to uh, in various ways and in uh, various development phases. There. The first one is this notion of uh, filaments. Um, and it started with one of our earliest projects. This is a project we did back in London, um, which was a, a small house, um, a, a weekend house for a friend of Peter's uh, who had bought a piece of land in Wales. So it's just a weekend retreat. And it started with a series of, of lines, of filaments. Uh, and we took these and gave them slightly different scales. And then this was all work that was done in Illustrator. So our computer. Uh, escapades for architecture work, and they still are. I mean, I, I don't do any programming work. I just use InDesign as my main design tool. Uh, so this was done in Illustrator. So in Illustrator, there's a function called uh, distort. Uh, so you take a line, and you can define how many points are on the line. And then you, def you give a, a definition of how far off of the line the line shifts. And it runs through a kind of random generation of, of these shifting uh, qualities. So gave the line a certain thickness and a certain number of points, and then when you click the button, it twists it to varying degrees. So we started looking at these, because what we were interested in is, again, as Neil said, that the question of the line also being about relationships. And the line going both a line as a demarcation, but also the line, uh, when it becomes thick enough, is also an object and a kind of spatiality in its own right. Uh, not just as the edge of something, but within its thickening becomes something that has its own interiority and its own ed its own edges uh, to it. So we ran through a whole process of, of just running these through this random generation, both in terms of the sort of uh, kink or twist in the line, but also in terms of how they relate to each other and where their positioning uh, with each other occurs. And those became to a certain degree, programmatic in terms of main living areas, 
uh, kitchens and bathrooms and uh, sleeping uh, accommodation. Very simple uh, programmatic conditions for this retreat house. Uh, and then running it through iterations, because we're very strong believers in iterative processes. Uh, we very much, all of our projects uh, work through a kind of iterative practice uh, and, and uh, process. Uh, so just generating these, <coughs> and generating enough that we can then start to make a kind of critical uh, relationship kind of critical analysis of what are the differences. So if we start to talk to a certain degree that this might be a living accommodation, this might be kitchens and toilets, and uh, this might be an entryway, or it might be, uh, you know, it might be that this is the kitchens and these are the, the bathrooms and sleeping area and this is the living area, whatever assignment we may give to it programmatically, but just to then begin a kind of comparative analysis of what those differences are. So there's a necessity in the, the numeration of iterations. I mean, there have to be enough to be able to generate differences. But it's not just an endless process, although for us it became quite an extensive process of, of generating this. But at the same time, there is an important kind of critical analytic, comparative analytic moment of saying, well, what does this mean consequentially, in terms of the spatial operation, uh, of a difference between this versus this versus this versus this, and so forth. And so after, we decided we would have to do at least a thousand uh, of these to be able to understand uh, what the differences might be and what the consequences of that might be. Coming out of that was another uh, set of works that we did where, uh, again, looking at this notion of filaments and uh, using the kind of graphic space of folded paper, uh, yellow trace, white trace, folded bending, laying on top, and starting to look at then what are the kind of spatial uh, interpretations of these conditions, both in terms of the transparency and the overlay but also in terms of at what point do you get a reading of a singularity of a very well-defined object versus something that's a bit more complicated or more difficult to sort of extract uh, and come out. And working through these and seeing you know, the degree to which that sort of filamental structure uh, begins to take on a certain uh, spatial consequence uh, and possibility uh, to it. And using some animation sequences, not because uh, it's about movement, but it's about the multiplicity, again, of these relationships. So as these filaments shift in relationship to each other, uh, the ability to imagine what does that mean and what are the consequences spatially in terms of movement through a space, but also in terms of overlap of space and the sort of conjoining and uh, uh, intersecting of those spaces and those conditions. And so it was out of that that we began to do a whole series of drawings as we did the competition for Federation Square back in 1997. Uh, so where we took, and in this one in fact starts off as a kind of tartan grid. We we're interested in the way that a tartan grid has a whole series of hierarchical relationships, but also the sort of visual reading of the tartan. So that some figures emerge and some figures recede within the same image. So there's no longer a singularity of how it can be read. There's multiplicities, depending on what you give uh, precedence to. But then running that through a series of programs and, and redrawing it uh, to get a different sort of figure. That's what emerged into Federation Square. So the, the sort of planning, both at an urban design point of view and also at the individual buildings, came out of that sequence of developments and uh, investigations about this overlap of filaments and the kind of multiplicity uh, and uh, co-joining of spaces that work at the level of the lines and of the thickness of, of the lines. These are just some images. This is, this is a promotion video from uh, the government. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen Federation Square, this is a quick way to show it, uh, because I'm not going to really talk about it otherwise uh, in any great detail. Uh, these are just some of the different spaces. I mean, for us, they became very important so that those lines 
also talk about the way, from an urban design point of view, the space as a precinct operates in terms of permeability, so that there are no singular buildings, although you go into buildings, but you also go through buildings to get somewhere else. So in terms of questions of how the buildings as cultural precincts uh, and civic precincts operate, that there is this notion of permeability. They're no longer singular civic destinations, but they're part of trajectories and journeys and uh, passages onward. Now, in particular, I want to talk about the, the National Gallery of Victoria uh, Australian Art, which was an art gallery that's part of the whole of Federation Square, but it was a part that was only added to the project after we won the competition which meant that we hadn't actually designed an art gallery as part of our design competition. So even though we were being asked to start documenting the whole of the project, we actually hadn't designed anything here yet. So we were doing this simultaneously with trying to imagine and sort of uh, uh, adjust the whole of the large-scale precinct, uh, but at the same time develop up a language for what uh, this art gallery might be. Uh, so we went through a whole series of, of developmental models. These are a whole series of blue foam models looking at, at, at how they might work. A lot of this because, in fact, we were starting from a kind of uh, uh, originating uh, uh, figuration of the site, which had to do with what we had done for the competition, and then to somehow convert it to be able to have an art gallery that had certain specific requirements. For instance, the, the director of the gallery wasn't part of the competition jury, so he wasn't particularly enamored with our architecture. And the first thing he did was say, well, if this is my gallery, why can't we just make a nice big rectangle? Uh, and that would be a really good art gallery. And we said, well, you know, it doesn't really work with a number of attitudes towards the rest of the site. And he said, yes, but you know, all art gallery spaces have to be rectangular. And we said, well, you know, we could probably show you. He said, well, my art gallery spaces have to be rectangular. <laughs> so I said, okay, we'll make rectangular spaces, but we'll still create a different kind of organizational system for, for the site. So we ran through this system uh, and this series of investigations, looking at all this, and we ended up with this, which again is about these filaments. So there's uh, one filament, sorry, let me just go back. So there's one filament which is more or less straight, and then another filament that kind of overlaps. It's almost like crossing your fingers uh, to it. But we did what he asked for, that is we produced eight rectangular galleries, but the organizational structure allowed for something else to happen. Because the other thing we were asked by the gallery themselves, the actual curators, is that on this floor level, they wanted to be able to show the collection of Australian art in a chronological uh, sequence. So starting from the earliest moment when the uh, Europeans arrived into Australia and how they perceived the landscape and, and the countryside, being able to show that historically in a timeline. So the figuration and the development of the gallery had to allow for us to be able to say, well, we can give you that. It just happens to be a kind of figure eight that you can move through in a continuous chronological sequence that produces this kind of figure eight. And that's the sort of galleries that we have, so as you move through in the sort of sequence. Now, there was a whole series of, of decisions about how those spaces and how the doorways are offset, so that instead of moving through an awful lot, it's a kind of ricochet effect, so you move through on a kind of angle across the space, slightly tangentially across the space, moving back across, and so on and so forth, because we felt that also was about shifting the relationship to the space. There's a hierarchy between the galleries on this side being much lower than the galleries on this side, and then on this side. Uh, so there's a sort of spatial differentiation as you move through. These are, again, some of the, the, the exhibitions and how they work. And then on the upper level, where they were going to have both contemporary collection, but also temporary exhibitions, in working again with the curators, not the director, because by that time he had left, uh, we were and gone to the Kimball, so you know where his heart really lied, uh, was actually saying, well, from a curatorial point of view, how do we talk about different uh, narratives? So, you know, chronological order and sequence is one narrative of art, but there are other sequences. And so 
using the same exact same layout, but being able to produce, for instance, temporary collection, which was located as a kind of uh, figure at the top, versus a secondary uh, temporary exhibition or collection that's taking place here, or being able to have one series, which is in the main gallery, and then two smaller subsets that were operating, or being able to have one collection that works through here and another collection that works through here. So using the same figure to create different relationships and therefore different curatorial narratives uh, throughout the gallery spaces. And these are some of those, those spaces. At the same time within the figuration, there is this one long filament and then this filament that wraps over, but there is a gap in between what we call the interfilament spaces. And these are bridging elements. So going from this gallery to this gallery, you go through a set of a kind of bridge. They become uh, step-out spaces, spaces you can go to to let your eyes relax, to read information, to have a conversation with somebody as opposed to being directly in the galleries. But they also become part of an orientation system so that as you move through in the northern end, you have a kind of volumetric space that's like this. And as you move through in the southern end, you have a space that operates. So this one operates very vertically, uh, where all of the view is upward to where the thin skylight's on either side. And this one, because it's facing south and therefore away from the sun, and out toward the riverside and the gardens, operates horizontally. So as you move through the galleries, you actually look out across the river and into the gardens on the other side of the river. So as you're moving through, whether it's in a figure eight or any other uh, sort of itinerary, there's a sense of orientation through these different uh, vertical spaces. Now, one of the projects that we did before Federation Square uh, was a competition also in, in Australia in a town called Wagga Wagga. Uh, this means, Wagga is the Aboriginal word for crow, and if it's Wagga Wagga, it means many crows. So this is the town of many crows. Uh, it's a competition that we got shortlisted, we didn't win, but uh, it was our first sort of entry into doing projects in Australia. Uh, and it began also with a notion of figuration. Um, Neil mentioned uh, my relationship to Daniel Leviskin, having studied with him at Cranbrook and then worked with him on some projects, but I also had a relationship, the reason I ended up in Cranbrook was because of John Hayduck. Uh, and so having met him in Houston when he came uh, as a visiting uh, critic on a number of occasions. And so there were some aspects in this project, which was a early, much earlier project than Federation Square, uh, that come out of some of the things that Haida was looking at in terms of this notion of lines and the sort of overlap of lines. And for us this was important because the project was about uh, a, uh, an existing civic center and uh, adding on a whole series of offices to it as well as some development. So there was an existing uh, council meeting hall here and they wanted to add a whole series of council offices. There was an existing theater that they wanted to renovate and add on to. They wanted to produce a library and also an art gallery uh, on the site. And so we added on these pieces again as these sort of overlapping filaments uh, that began to work <coughs> together. And part of the reason for that was in terms of this notion of how it operated uh, programmatically because we had the uh, existing sort of town hall and the council chambers and the meeting spaces, but the council in Wagga Wagga also had its own, they were the, they handled the, the gas for the city, they handled the, the water system, they handled the, the road uh, repairs and so on and so forth, they handled the, the, the social services. So, Administratively, this was a number of agencies operating together, and we wanted to give some sense of differentiation to those. So these filaments became the sort of repositories for different administrative activities. So as it went through, uh, we had the council offices, the meeting spaces, and then the administration offices. And the public sort of entry points here, coming into the building, but then this would be, for instance, the services that dealt with municipal services like water, gas, uh, road repair, and so on and so forth. Whereas this one might be with social services. And there are certain points where there are overlaps. Now some of that might just be in terms of accounting and finance and some of those facilities. 
Some of it may be in terms of equipment that were being used, or coffee rooms, or, or luncheon rooms, and so on and so forth. And uh, I can't remember what this one is. There's another series of, of council functions. But the same thing was that the council was also privatizing a number of their activities. So trying to use this figuration as having some flexibility so that in the future, some of these could expand and others could contract. And then the relations, the internal relationships would change, but they would happen within the, the given figuration. Coming out of that work was a competition that we did for BMW in Leipzig. This is a competition that Zaha won and, and, and built. We got second prize on this project. Uh, Jesse Reiser uh, was also uh, on this. Um, and again, it was, so for BMW, these are the factories. So this is where they store all of the, the pressed metal parts. This is where they paint everything, and this is where they assemble the BMW 3 Series. And the competition was for the administrative center that operates between all of that. And so we developed it again with this notion of a series of twisted, overlapping uh, filaments. Because again, it was about the way that these had commonalities, moments of commonality between the, the different <coughs> operations, but also uh, clear sort of differential uh, conditions in terms of who they were accessed by, what times of the day they were being operated, and, and most uh, in the condition. We're also working with the notion that these were offices, so therefore they had a certain dimensional relationship. Uh, and then ending up with uh, uh, courtyard spaces and open spaces in between, so we had natural light to all of the offices and the way they work. So that the overall plan becomes a series of filaments that overlap, with courtyards that are internal or courtyards that are outside in terms of green air and fresh air and, and light coming into to all of the offices. And so the, the roof itself becomes this kind of folded element that is itself a long extended. These all become sawtooth roofs, so we get a lot of natural light in the upper levels. We get the gaps in between and so forth. And just part of the stu structural diagram of how those roof systems This is jumping around, so this is not in chronological order. Uh, after, we won Federation Square in 1997, and it took five years to build. And during that time, we basically only did that except for the BMW project, which we did at the very end of uh, the construction of Federation Square. After Federation Square was completed, we've never built another project in Australia yet. Uh, and so we had to look elsewhere, and so one of the Places we started doing a lot of work in was in the Middle East, uh, in Dubai. We set up an office in Dubai. And this was a competition that we were uh, invited to uh, in Dubai. Uh, it's a cultural building, uh, a theater, and a museum. Uh, but it's really just a feature for a large-scale residential development. So this is in the center of a very large uh, development plan. Uh, and they have this sort of water access, or this was, none of this got built, so uh, this was just a, our competition entry. So we had this idea of using this water feature uh, as something that we would float over and then be underneath and then come back out again. So the building begins uh, actually down here. So you enter the building from the parking underneath the water and then go into the theater space or go into the museum space. So the building itself sort of is this, we call it a snake in the lake. Uh, so this kind of figure, again, that emerges above and below uh, the water. This is the entry uh, to the main foyer, going off to the museum on one side and the, the theater space on the other side. Other projects that, that emerged, so uh, again in Dubai, uh, a competition for a large residential hotel and apartment development on Dubai waterfront. Uh, we didn't win this competition and nothing's ever been built on Dubai waterfront after the global financial crisis. Uh, but again, was looking at imagining this building in terms of series of different scaled apartments and where they have conjoined uh, 
as again this sort of uh, series of filaments, but now vertically uh, orientated. But the other project that we did work, and we put a lot of time, we went through about three iterations uh, or versions of this project, was a project called Culture Village, uh, or Culture Island. Our part of it was called Culture Island, and the, the development, the commercial real estate development was called Culture Village. But like a lot of things in Dubai, uh, that was just a good name. It had nothing to do with what was there. So all of this that you see, the project itself is all of this back around to here. And all of this, these are residential, this is a big shopping mall, these are office buildings, this is a big hotel. So there's no culture at Culture Village. Uh, so at the very end, they had this one little island left over, and they said, oh, well, maybe we should put something in. Uh, so we developed, a, it's called a Museum of the Creek. It's about the history of Dubai and its relationship to the creek, to trading, to pearling, to... Uh, uh, transportation, uh, the creek itself being where Dubai was founded and started. But importantly for us, it was also about the landscape, uh, because most people think of Dubai as a very hot place, which it is, hot and humid, but that's only for about five months of the year. The rest of the year, it's actually a really quite good place, but there is no place to go to. And this development, this artificial development with artificial canals and waterways, again made it very difficult to make a connection between the, the road level, which was elevated, uh, the roads coming up here, which are about eight meters from the water level. Because, you know, it's a kind of inner logic where they thought it would be a great idea to have a lot of canals, so they cut the canals artificially. But then they got to get over the canals so that they can have enough height for boats to come through, which means that the, the street level has to be eight meters above the ground level which means that when you arrive, you're nowhere near the water, which is the whole reason you went there in the first place. So part of the project was as much about the external spaces as it was about the, the museum uh, building itself. And the gardens the, that exist uh, on, on the outside here, and those spaces, which in the Dubai climate become really quite important. This is inside the museum, so a whole series of spaces looking back towards the creek uh, because the sort of visible connection uh, that you have back to the water and, and to the spaces. And then the boats, the dowels, which were constructed historically on this site, but are now, of course, pushed someplace else so that they can now use this as a residential and commercial development site. Uh, so there's kind of strange irony in taking away the area, the very thing that they want to celebrate. But that's Dubai for me. This was a, a, a competition that we won uh, back in uh, 2008 uh, for a commercial high-rise apartment and hotel building. Again, a series of sort of vertical filaments could join together uh, so that the, the, the hotel operates in this taller filament over on this side. There's a series of service apartments here, and then for sale apartments uh, in this lower level, and then a small uh, retail uh, podium uh, on the level, lower level. Um, this project didn't get built uh, because the builder went bankrupt with a financial crisis uh, just after we won the competition. And then more recently, um, after, after not having really worked in, in Australia, uh, we set up in uh, China. And so most of the work that we've done in the last 10 years has either taken place in China, or the Middle East, or India, or a little bit back in, in Europe. Uh, we've done projects in Australia, but we haven't built anything uh, there. This was a project for a, uh, a customs gateway between Macau and mainland China. Uh, so it's just a series of, of administration and warehousing buildings, as well as a sort of customs toll booth uh, that connects. So Macau is over on this side, and then you go across a bridge and you're in mainland China. Uh, and so across this bridge here, so this goes back into Macau. Uh, and it's a place where you come in and have to show what you're carrying across to go in, and vice versa as you come back. So a series of offices and administration <coughs> and then uh, the trucks come in and get inspected, and uh, some of their uh, 
things are carried get uh, warehoused uh, in these places here. And then more recently, uh, a project in, in Xiamen um, for a uh, ferry terminal, a cruise terminal building connected with uh, an exhibition center. Xiamen is the, the port that, and the city that's the closest to Taiwan. And there's a very strong uh, link between Xiamen and, and Taiwan. And so this exhibition center is because a lot of people come by ferry boat to here to look at products that are being produced in China and looking at trade opportunities in both directions, so from Taiwan to China and from China, mainland China back to Taiwan. So the ferry terminal is less about tourism than it is about business. So it's a sort of business ferry terminal, uh, you might say. Uh, so this is actually a large exhibition hall for the display of a lot of products either from Taiwan, so that people from uh, mainland China can come and look at, or products and uh, artifacts from uh, mainland China that are on display here so that when the, the Taiwanese businessmen come, uh, they can look at this and see what's uh, being produced in the, the local areas. This has a hotel and then office buildings along this side. The very first project that we actually did together uh, Peter Davidson and myself as lab, uh, came out of actually a very different sort of formulation. The filaments has been something that's been very strong with us and with it in its development Federation Square has, has re-emerged a lot. But the actual first project that we worked on together as part of lab uh, came out of a strategy which we call aggregation, which was a lot of our earliest research were looking at images like this. These are thin rock sections, uh, sections through rock. Uh, and we were interested in trying to understand how we could start to discern some sort of organizational principles within what appears to be fairly chaotic. But if you start to look, you see that these uh, small pieces of different minerals, obviously, have certain kind of alignments, some certain orientation, certain scalar relationships, so that the black are always of a certain scale, whereas the blue are of a different scale, and so on and so forth. So we were. We're interested in how we might use that. And the first project we worked on was with the Cardiff Bay Opera House. Um, Greg worked on this uh, competition as well, and Baron Chevelle and uh, Jeff Kipnis, and a whole number of other friends, uh, Stan Allen, Jesse, a whole number of people that worked on this. This is a project that Zaha won that never got built. So for us, the, the, the Opera House became, and I know it's a little bit difficult maybe to see, but Effectively, the main theater space, so the actual auditorium, is a consequence of jamming everything else that goes into the program together. So it's the leftover space. So as opposed to starting with the theater and adding on to it, we worked the other way around, where we took all of the components, all of the back house, back of house, the rehearsal spaces, the administration offices, the restaurants, the cafes, the toilets, the storage, the security offices, everything else, and work them in some sort of close packing arrangement with enough left over to allow the actual theater space, the auditorium, uh, to emerge out of that. So that there's this, this sort of aggregative, uh, aggregated quality of the spaces jumbling together in slightly shifted and, and closely packed, dense relationships but with the main destination being the one thing that's not designed. It's kind of the leftover space uh, that works in between things. And out of that, the, another project that we did in Melbourne was a, a retail strategy where we were given, again, a very large, uh, fairly large uh, floor plate area to set up as a, a retail uh, environment, but where there would be a whole range of different uh, secondary uh, uh, retailers using small parts of it. So this was this is more like a large department store, like a Macy's or something like this, but where we also wanted to be able to differentiate both the different brands and where they were located, but also the different, uh, you know, shoes being different from dresses, being different from cosmetics, being different from uh, belts and ties and so on and so forth. So there's a kind of banding that runs through here with these little small filaments, but these filaments are also changing in a kind of wave sign. So they're going up in height 
or going down. So sometimes they're used as benches, sometimes they're used as closets, sometimes they're used as storage racks, sometimes they're used as surfaces uh, for, for different materials. And then this, uh, again, these uh, sort of uh, colonizations that are used for different uh, retailers. So, you know, maybe it's uh, uh, Subi is over here, and uh, Yugo Boss is over here, and so on and so forth. But then also, and the reason we call it zoology, it's also a classification system of different artifacts being within a kind of zonal uh, relationships versus the differentiation between the retailers and how they operate. So that the, the uh, storage and display cases move up and down in these series of waves, although these lines are more or less the same width in a linear fashion, but they also fulfill different roles in terms of their display use. The second project that we worked on as a competition after the Cardiff Bay was a competition in, in Edinburgh for the Scottish Architecture and Design Centre. This was a project where they wanted a, uh, an architecture uh, gallery space and design centre, as well as uh, a series of offices, just commercial offices, because this is how they were going to support and subsidise the design centre. Uh, it was to have a library, it was to have a lecture hall, and it was also to have a, a cinema uh, embedded within it. So there were these, th effectively, three different things that were going on uh, within the overall uh, piece of this. And, and we started coming up with something we've called these excavated voids, or excavated matrix, where what we, we started off, and we basically covered the whole site with a, a sort of solid matrix, <coughs> which we felt would be the offices. And then within that matrix, we excavated spaces out. Doing that so that effectively all of the interior office space was no more than 10 meters from an outside wall, as in a kind of uh, garden, I mean a, a kind of uh, open void. So in terms of natural light and fresh air. And then embedded back into those voids were the exhibitions, the, the library here, the exhibition space, and the, the cinema. So these sort of three figurations that were happening in kind of solid matrix, and then all of the circulation exists on the outside. So both circulation in terms of stairs and passageways, as well as all the public facilities like toilets and uh, um, some of the services that are operating around these centers. And so this became a, another um, sort of uh, system of, of developing, and the next one was a competition that we were shortlisted on uh, in Sydney for a, uh, a sort of student services building on the campus at the University of Sydney. Um, there's a building across, uh, there's a main road, but because of height uh, differences, there's a bridge that, that accesses it, so you come in at one level, or you come in at the street level, and then this uh, student administration building that's joined on to another uh, existing building. Uh, so you come in either at the street level here or across this bridge element uh, at the upper level. And again, the, the building itself, the actual accommodation, is only on two levels. Uh, and we had this excavated void, so we have a kind of solid matrix of offices. But these punch voids that go all the way through that bring light into all of the office spaces. So again, all of the offices here were no more than eight meters away from either fresh air or, or light uh, coming from up above. But using that in changing the plan from one level to the next so that the orientation and the way that, so that as it moves to the upper level, these voids stay in the same place, but they're, they're, they're not as full at one level compared to the other level. So there's a shift in planning and organization and directionality as you move from one level uh, to the upper level. So this sort of matrix, the solid part which has the offices that are raised above, that sits above which forms an, an outdoor but covered eating area at the street level uh, that you see down here. So at the street level it's down here but that's also where the voids go through to the upper level offices that are on two floors up above this. So these become covered uh, seating areas with uh, cafes and restaurants around the perimeter of this space. Then that, we took that project forward in a, a, a competition we did in Doha, in Qatar, which was for the Supreme Council for Family Affairs. It's effectively a kind of social services for the country. 
the main uh, social services building in, in Doha, which has two roles. So on the one hand, it is for the public, so people to come in to talk about problems they're having in terms of uh, their family or to get uh, financial or public support for various activities in terms of children, in terms of health, in terms of education, and so on and so forth. But it's also the main administrative center for this service for the whole country. So it has one level which is not open to the public, which is for the, the people working in the administration offices. And then it has a whole series of contact points for, for the public. So we use this, this notion of this double layer and these sort of punched voids to create two systems of, of orientation. So here we have the, the, the site plan. Uh, and we'll get into, and so we have effectively an arrival along this side for the public and drop off and coming into the main entrance, and along this back side or underneath in the basement for the people working here uh, for the administration office. So the public space is sort of sandwiched between the basement parking and the upper level administration offices. So we get this uh, sort of series of uh, lower ground, which is a whole parking basement, open air parking. Uh, then the first level of, uh, of uh, public uh, offices and contact points and meeting rooms. And then the upper level of administration, which is not open to the public. And then a series of skylights that connect and, and join up uh, between these. So at the ground level, the orientation is like this. So come in through the main areas, some big meeting rooms, uh, cafeteria and dining. And then a whole series of offices where people meet to discuss privately their concerns or things that are happening within their families. And then a series of internal courtyard spaces that are operating within these. On the upper level, it's a different kind of orientation because here it's about the administration and uh, their relationship, the different hierarchical relationships uh, within the administration and how they operate. And then these two overlap uh, on top of each other. So in the, the, the ground floor come in and the main movement lines are in uh, east to west direction. On the upper level, the internal organization operates on north-south orientation and access and entry coming in this way. And then finally we use that as part of a, a sort of schema for a villa that we designed in, in Dubai uh, that got built, but I don't have photographs because was taken over by the crown prince and then we can't get photographs of it. Uh, but again, the, the, basically it's the it, planning wise, it's very similar. So this is the basement. This is a single family residence of uh, it's about 60,000 square, square feet single family house uh, as you have in Dubai. Uh, so this is in the basement. Uh, this is the entertainment room. Uh, this is uh, the kitchen areas are back here, the maids quarters and the various uh, help uh, are located back here. Uh, at the street level, uh, you come in off of the street here to a foyer, public uh, or uh, uh, formal meeting spaces uh, along here, a formal dining space, very large kitchen, and then a private breakfast uh, uh, room here uh, a swimming pool that's partly covered and partly open uh, underneath. And then the family public spaces. I mean, in, this is not just because of wealth, it's also a social condition. So that there's a very big difference in terms of where entertainment takes place with outsiders versus entertainment within the family and how that's associated. And then this is an internal uh, a garden uh, 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 courtyard uh, for the space and then a guest room on this level. On the next level up, then again, there's a shift in orientation. You get a series of bedrooms, so a bedroom here with an outdoor terrace, another bedroom also with an outdoor terrace, a bedroom with an outdoor terrace. These become voids down to where the swimming pool is. This is a void down to the garden area along this side as well. Uh, a secondary kitchen and uh, outdoor eating area and outdoor space here. And then the master bedroom, which is all of this area here, which has its own, uh, well, it's big. Uh, and then the roof plan. So these, are, these become uh, terraces 
that are accessed by, so the master bedroom has this terrace, this bedroom has this terrace, this bedroom has this terrace over here, and this small balcony along this side here. And then finally, a kind of version where we've mixed the two together. So between the filaments and the, the sort of excavated void, this very large scale project, this is a project for Qatar Airways. The airport in Doha is located here. And they're effectively building a village for 10,000 employees, um, and uh, which are pilots, engineers, stewardesses, uh, working staff, and so on and so forth. Uh, so effectively a self-contained village that also has uh, recreation facilities, it has garden areas for children, because the, the, the engineers and the pilots have family there, the, the flight staff are single men and women. Uh, that are located there. These are just some of the orientations. So we, we started off with this idea of a kind of courtyard, uh, but started to bind it together as a kind of matrix, and then started to shift it, and then start to break it down so that we use the, the roofscape as different level terraces for uh, the residential units, or we carve them out so that there is connections that move in between uh, through these. So the matrix ends up being like this. Now the, these colors are specific. So the, the reddish color are the uh, women flight attendants or administrative staff, but single women. The blue are single men flight attendants or administrative staff. And the yellow are families, which are only senior en junior engineers, senior engineers, junior pilots, and senior pilots, and senior administration. So they're quite specific uh, gender separation uh, within the, the organization. And so the, the female staff, the male staff, and the family staff. That's a, that's a word. These are just the points. So you can see, even though there's a kind of overall matrix that joins all of these together, but at the ground level, there are openings. So you move through these courtyards. So they're not just the formal entry points that you go into the buildings with the lifts and stairs but also the gardens become open gardens. Although they're enclosed and quasi-privatized, they're also open. And so you move through the sort of urban fabric across it, not just along the main entry points. Major plazas that are embedded within those, which are something like this, where food and beverage, uh, services, laundry, uh, shopping, and so on and so forth. Uh, external public zones, so where the public can come in and meet people who are living here. Uh, the services and deliveries access of community hub, blah, 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 quickly. And then the gardens in the courtyards, as well as then there are gardens on, on some of the roofscapes uh, as well. So the gardens that form part of these courtyards that open up, but then also gardens on these upper terrace levels uh, as well. Uh, and these are just showing the different levels as they stack up uh, and, and where they open up. Through. And then this is just a, a sample of one of the, the ones. So accommodation, uh, single door corridors on either side, but then uh, private terraces and recreational on the, the stepping terraces of the roofs. And then finally, the, the, the version that's developed was one that, uh, again, a competition we did with uh, Jeff Kipnis for the Kansai Kan National Library. Uh, competition. This was a project that Jeff was the architect and we just drew things up and made it work. Um, and it was a very simple sort of diagram, but I mean, it was, uh, I think it's a great one, where we have this very uh, solid rectangular box that's been sort of excavated out, kind of cut open, and then the stacks for the books themselves are in a kind of very solid form like almost a rock uh, that appears within it. So. The, the services, the administration, some of the stacks that are connected underground operate on these edges, and this dark, solid, uh, volumetric object uh, is the, the collection itself, because it's all automated in terms of collection and bringing it out to the research. So there's no, the public doesn't have access to these spaces anyway. So it's, it's a little bit hard to see in these images, but the outside of the building would be incised with all the names of the Famous Japanese poets. Hopefully, we carved these correctly. Uh, Hatoshi can tell me. Uh, and then this solid kind of rock uh, figure that's uh, in between with the, the book collection. And so, the outside where the where the 
this to the external surfaces of these two forms is straight vertical glazing and so forth, whereas the inside is kind of faceted, uh, slightly carved uh, surface with some penetrations. And so coming out of that, the uh, uh, competition we did in, in, in Brisbane after Federation Square was finished was a competition for a new museum of modern art. This is a complex called the South Bank in Brisbane. There's the <coughs> State Library here. There's an existing art gallery here, an existing historical museum here, uh, a uh, concert hall and theater uh, feature here, and then a whole series of gardens and uh, exhibition <coughs> centers. So, they were looking to design a modern art uh, uh, museum uh, or gallery uh, because this one was no longer large enough to hold all the collections uh, that they wanted to have. It's in a very important place. The downtown of Brisbane is over here. So you can just start to see the city grid that's located over on this side. So this is on the south bank. This is the Brisbane River that moves around. But in a very interesting way in Brisbane, this whole edge is a motorway. I mean, pretty you know, <coughs> debilitating kind of cutting off of the city from the river's edge, but also quite interesting in its dynamic. So the cars are coming from the south along here and sweeping along and coming into the city or continuing on around. At the same time, you have a major uh, bridge that comes across here and a major bridge here that connects to the downtown. Uh, in this area here, and then there's a railway bridge that's coming up. Here. But Bri Brisbane is also a city that's served a lot by uh, motorboats uh, as a ferry service. They have a catamaran, uh, high-speed uh, ferries that circulate from uh, docking points along here all the way over to the University of Queensland, which is in here. So there was something about this point, which was about its sense of rotation about it always being in movement. So the, the design that we wanted to pursue was to look at how to deal with not a singular vantage point or viewpoint, but multiple viewpoints, both from inside and from outside. So as you move around this site, you see the sort of facets and the edges of the building in a very different way, but also internally in terms of the operation of the galleries, they have different kinds of orientations that don't align from one level to the next level. So we start off with a kind of trapezoidal volume as a sort of solid matrix. Uh, and then we develop up a series of gallery spaces and other exhibition spaces that join together that have more to do with their uh, curatorial uh, procession than they have to do with creating one singular object. So in fact, the matrix, the trapezoidal matrix, sort of binds them together. And a lot of the foyer spaces are the space once you go out of the gallery and you're within the sort of captured space uh, of the trapezoid, uh, so to speak. So you get these three figures working together. Uh, so on one level when you come in, the galleries have a certain kind of orientation. And so these views have to do with where you're looking across the river, where you're looking back the other way, where you're out. And so there's a certain sequence and a logic to the orientation of these galleries operating at this level coming in through the entrance into the foyer spaces, the ticketing, uh, a cinema over on this side, the back of house, and uh, research and such on this side, to going up on the next level, where the orientation is totally different again. And uh, the alignments and uh, relationships of, of where and how they come together are, are quite different. From that. Sorry, my buttons. And so, so the building itself then, and, and then we tried to accentuate that in terms of the sort of rotation around this, the site so that the, the outside of this trapezoid is made up of uh, glass uh, planks that are themselves shifting in their orientation, both in terms of where they are climatically, in terms of where the sun is, but also in order to break up the surface uh, with the orientation uh, of, of those glass plank. So they operate as a kind of skin, a kind of uh, uh, shading uh, structure, even though they're frosted glass, uh, to the outside and then the internal spaces uh, inside and then the volumes themselves. So you can see this motorway as it runs itself around. Out of that, we did a, a competition in, back in China in Shenzhen uh, for a cultural precinct. 
uh, an opera house, a uh, youth center with exhibition space, and a library. I'll go a little bit faster now, we're getting a bit late. Uh, so again, these three very prismatic uh, sculpted volumes, uh, each operating a little bit differently, but having some sense of a collective uh, uh, sensibility in terms of their formal structure, but dealing differently. So within the opera house, a series of two theaters, and how that volumetric occurs. Uh, within the, the, the youth center and exhibition space, the sort of cusp uh, objects that come together forming a kind of courtyard between these two, uh, and the planning that works on that. And then within the library, the slope surfaces that becomes an outdoor space, uh, and the, 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 the actual uh, gallery, uh, the, the collection, the book collection here with some auditoriums and then these are just running through the, the elevations uh, of those different forms so you get some sense of how the massing uh, for them works. More recently, we had a project. We had done a master plan for an area called Shitahu, which is a new town. And uh, after they uh, accepted the master plan, they asked us to design the council building. Uh, but it's actually a little bit more than that. So half of this building is the council offices for this new town, and the other half is a hotel. So it's the first time I've seen a municipal council building joined with a hotel. Uh, but we designed it uh, so that uh, it's sort of self-shading, so on the southern edge it's cut away and sloped, so there's no real direct sun uh, during the summertime on this space. And then on the back side, uh, have the back of house, so the, there's no direct light that's coming in. Uh, and then on the sides, on the east and west sides, uh, we have a series of bloopers that again have orientation depending on the, the sun direction, the sun angle. But a kind of sculpted object uh, in, in the landscape sitting here on, on the part of this new town of uh, And this one's just about finished. Uh, so you can see on this side it's all glazed, but uh, there's no real direct sunlight. And then here we have a series of bloopers uh, shading the windows. Um, but these are, you know, there's like three, three levels, three levels of louvers per every floor. So it's not a, it's not a 25-story building. It's only a 12-story, I think. <clears throat> okay. Finally, uh, columns and cores. This came. This was the first project we did after Federation Square. Uh, this is a, a small scale competition in Beijing. Uh, there's a client, Soho, Soho China, very, very well-known developer, uh, and they have an existing site. They bought a project from another developer who couldn't build, they didn't have the money. So Soho bought the site, but it meant they already bought the planning approval. So effectively, it was an envelope that we had to put our building into. So they wanted something totally different. It's a kind of neoclassical design that the previous developer had. They wanted something more contemporary. but. We had a building envelope that we couldn't change. So we had to achieve their floor areas that they needed, uh, 100 meter high, 33 story uh, residential tower, 33 story office tower, uh, another small office tower, and five levels of uh, retail uh, within the whole complex. So kind of l shape connected through, so the retail connects through this whole uh, so the site uh, is like this, so the residential tower, the office tower, another small office tower, and then this retail podium that's spanning across with a, a kind of bridging element. So what we ended up doing was developing up, uh, well, I'll just get to the plans first. I mean, this is inside, this is the way it operates internally in terms of the shopping mall, the retail podium, uh, with these voids and open air spaces uh, in between here was working with, uh, and the reason that this category is called columns and grids was uh, everything is done with a very, very conventional structural grid. So there's a core, very conventional sort of core, and a conventional column grid. And all of the play is with the cantilever. In China, we're able to have a cantilever, these are all uh, reinforced concrete uh, framing uh, for the buildings. We're able to cantilever up to about four meters, so about uh, 12 foot or, or thereabouts, uh, in any direction from, from the columns. 
So every floor plate in the building is slightly different because as it's going up, it's uh, sloping in or being chopped off or faceted in one way or another and then gets taller. So at the upper levels are also the biggest floor plates because they sell for the most. So there's this kind of whole play between where the most uh, square meterage is while having to work parametrically to make sure that the overall amount of square meterage is, is the same. This building altogether, including the, the retail, is about 1.7 million square feet uh, of development. So as you go up, you see these outlines here. These are just showing the different floor plates, uh, either above or below, uh, all stacked on top of each other. But it wasn't, I mean, some of that was just a formal play that we were interested in, but it also had a, uh, an economic value, not just because the upper levels were larger, but also because every single apartment is slightly different size. And in the China market, that's important because some people can get a loan for $100,000 or let's say $50,000. And some people can get a loan for $52,000. And some people can only get $48,000. So being able to have a kind of large array of slightly different apartments, some apartments are 72 square meters, some are 73, some are 75, and so on and so forth, meant that they had a larger uh, repertoire of potential clients uh, to develop. This is just looking at the facade. And this was it as it was being finished. Uh, and this is it a bit more recently. So this is the smaller office tower on the corner and then the retail podium uh, that you see along here. This was finished about five years ago, five or six years. And then we used that same principle. This was a competition that we did in Dubai that didn't get built uh, for a small 18-story office building where, again, every side, it was important for us that every side was different. There was no symmetry whatsoever in the facades. Uh, and that difference was made up just in terms of the cantilever off a very standard grid. So from a constructional point of view, it's very simple to build. But from a formal point of view, we got a kind of offset uh, uh, tower in terms of the overall structure. Uh, and again, we used this for a competition back in Doha, again, for a, about a 60-story bank building, uh, which we did not And then we developed it for another project also in Business Bay. And here we started, uh, whereas before we were kind of faceting a single uh, uh, rectangular block, here we started subdividing the block. So, taking, if you would, a rectangular extruded block and cutting it and then pushing and pulling those subdivisions <coughs> so that they move out or offset or even rotate one to another. Um, so it's still within the column grid and just the cantilever overlap, but that really developed in this project we did in Abu Dhabi called Guardian Towers, which were two, two buildings, so an office building and a residential building joined together with a, a retail podium. Where again, the play here was trying to break up the solid extrusion of a regular uh, office tower, whether it's residential or commercial offices. So we have, uh, just in the diagram, the, the residential tower, the office tower, the podium, and the underground parking, three levels of one, sorry. Um, so these are just running through the elevation, so you can see the sort of shift and the, the sort of faceting that, that takes place in between those, as well as the, the joints and where they, they come down. And then this was, this was completed about a year and a half ago. Uh, so the, the residential tower has a double skin. There's an outside uh, surface of glass with a lot of openings uh, for ventilation and also uh, to get air in and up and out. And then the actual apartments with balconies have a secondary series of just regular sliding doors and windows set behind, whereas the office building is uh, solid uh, curtain wall construction. So here it's a little bit easier to read. So these are open because these are balconies inside, but the glass is acting as a shading device as well to the, to the internal uh, apartments. And then uh, a, a 
design we did in, in Fiji where we had two buildings, one which was for a hotel with guests and one which were service apartments. So just using this sort of play with the, the balconies and how much that's offset to create a kind of rhythmic uh, rotation on the, the, the one that was used for the, the, the tourist visitation and much simpler one for the, for the residents uh, have service apartments here. And then that, that developed in this project uh, that we have in, in Tianjin. This is the first series that we did. So again, we're shifting and offsetting these sort of masses. Uh, and that went through a whole development. We had a whole number of different facade possibilities uh, that we went through to look at and see what that happened. And then the client changed the program totally. So instead of having uh, two towers, they decided they wanted three towers. They wanted a separate tower for offices and then two shorter towers for residential uh, and service apartments. So we had to come back and redo it. And we started to end up with a very different sort of uh, facade, where again, we have this kind of rotational uh, in and out uh, corrugation uh, to, to the facade. And this is what uh, then has been built, or is in the process of being built currently. This is what it's supposed to look like when it's finished. So you have residential service apartments here, a hotel here, and then in the background, uh, sort of 65-story uh, office building. And out of that, we went back to some of the, this is a project that's, I just have a couple of images. This one's just started construction uh, a couple of months ago, where we're going back to the sort of facade and the offset that we had uh, on the first version of the project. This is in Nanjing, whereas the previous one is in Tianjin. And we did this competition, I'll just show this very quickly. This was a, a competition uh, in Dubai. Again, the creek, the, the project that I showed you before was, was down in, in this area here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the creek in, in Dubai. And all along here, although they have a big modern port farther out, this is where Dubai really started with the wharfages where the dows, the boats come in and offload their cargo right in the middle of the city. And there was a, a plan to keep them, so it's not about taking away uh, the, the wharfages and the use for all of these boats tying up and unloading, but they wanted to build a project here, so they did a competition to build on top of this somehow. So these were the points where you could have footings and foundations or at the ends of these, uh, uh, these piers, and then connect back to the parking, which was going to be over here. So there's some sort of monorail uh, sort of connecting. So this is a uh, you know, fairly good distance along here. Um, and so we decided uh, to do a horizontal uh, skyscraper. Uh, so they, they wanted uh, offices and uh, a lot of uh, food and beverage, cafes, restaurants, and so on and so forth, as well as a hotel and a connection. So we ended up uh, deciding to, to look at this as one long connected. So instead of having three that are connected by the road, to actually make this as, uh, as a horizontal uh, skyscraper. So, because if we put our, our building next to the Burj Khalifa, uh, it's two-thirds of the height of the Burj Khalifa, uh, and much taller than any of the other buildings that exist in Dubai. We didn't win this competition. And then taking that one step further was to, to look at that in terms of, this was a, a hotel and residential tower in Bahrain. Um, where we just use, I mean, again, the structural grid is exactly the same. So it's a very uh, simple system of cores and, and columns. And the sort of uh, Boolean cutout is just where the balconies extend or retract all the way back to, to the structure. So all of the play in terms of that surface is just with the terracing of the balconies and some of the rooms. And then at the lower level where we can have secondary structural support, then we can come out even further and have a bit more of a play with that. And then the final project that came out of that was this one in, in Riyadh. This was a competition that we did win, but the project never got built, where the developer said they wanted uh, 800,000 square feet of offices, but they didn't care how it was done. So we came up with a scheme to have a range uh, of, of, of offices from very small buildings, with very small floor plates, so that we could have small startup offices, all the way to very large, tall buildings, but also very large floor plates. And in fact, these two buildings join together. 
So the floor plates at certain levels become even larger. And as the buildings go up, uh, there's a, there was an opportunity for them to tilt and still be on their structural axis. Uh, so it starts from the smaller and works its way up where these two buildings tilt quite a bit because they're actually joining each other, so structurally supporting each other. So there's kind of play between those two. And then being in Riyadh where it gets very hot in the summer but it's quite dry, the actual main entry point is in what we call the canyon, which is this slope uh, excavation at a lower level, which is more or less always in shade, which becomes where all the food and beverage and retail and also the entry points to all of the towers as well as to the parking, which is underneath uh, the ground within these areas here. Okay, and then finally, this is a project that's got nothing to do with any of the other stuff uh, that I've talked about. It was, a, it was a recent project that we were commissioned by the government to look at what might happen to extend Federation Square with a whole different set of, of uh, utilizations and activities and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just let this run. So this was again about having to build over the railway. So this is Federation Square here. And this site currently exists as just an opening with the railway running below. We look at it in terms of stages because of the financing is quite complicated. So the first is just literally building the structural deck and having a garden for a couple of years. And then coming and building this large uh, great hall uh, with also the activities and the facilities looking out to, to, the, to, the, to the riverside. Then adding an extension to the National Gallery of Victoria, which is located here, a series of kiosks and buildings. And then eventually building a hotel with offices and exhibition spaces uh, within that. And then creating a large outdoor space because there are certain activities that can't happen in Federation Square in terms of the scale and in terms of its orientation and the fact that it's a sloping surface. So Federation Square has become quite popular. We get 10 million visitors a year uh, to Federation Square. So there is a constant need. They do 2,600 events at Federation Square each year and they still have a lot more that want to happen. So this was a project to look at what that development and that extension uh, might be and how it might configure itself. Thank you. based on either you, your, your methodology for, for working, a lot, of, uh, a lot of organizational thought going into the plan, not to dismiss the section, but correlation between so much floor plate now that you're building, and we understand the relationship between where uh, the, the, the play is after the pro formas. Seeing this kind of, kind of array of, of facades, um, which you didn't, you, you touched on a little bit, and um, I wonder if is it a case of not having the time to focus on it in the talk, uh, not having time to focus on it in the office because you have to deliver, and uh, not not to not to kind of pin you down in a certain way, but we see you know, dark facades and gold facades and gradient projects, uh, folded systems that have a punch card overlay and so forth, and, and again, sorry to be so journalistic, but maybe in a nutshell, can you can you kind of talk about what you're confronting generally in the envelope, what you're trying to succeed with in the envelope? Yeah, I mean, first, um, uh, we just started uh, yesterday project number 350. So in 17 years, we've now done 350 projects. We've only built about a dozen. So we don't have a real good success rate uh, with getting projects built. But 
part of the consequence of doing that mini is that uh, you know th there's a real struggle to keep rethinking the facade. And simultaneous with that, most of our work is in China or the Middle East. And in both locations, image totally supersedes plan. I mean, we've had a number of projects, I mean, literally within the last two weeks, where you know, we're told on Monday, oh, we've just got this commission to do this thing. Could we, could we get a, an image by Wednesday? And we said, well, what is the project? I mean, and they said, don't, don't worry about it. It just has to be 150 meters high, and it has to be. So, but, but, you know, don't worry. Just, just any image. Just you know, <coughs> So it's a, it's a huge problem working in these locations, because image is what sells the project. I mean, most of the projects we work on, uh, particularly in China, are competitions, but they're competitions between three or four companies. And we mostly get paid, not a lot, but something to do it. So whether we win or lose, we get a, a small fee. But you're constantly going against three or four other people. It's not, it's not sitting down having a converse, conversation as part of the commissioning process. It's actually do something first and then get a reaction from the client as to whether they like it or don't like it. And then you actually build the, the brief by doing something. So usually we don't have a brief. There is no such thing as a brief that says this many square meters of office plus this much this plus this much this. You just start doing stuff. I mean, usually we know what the maximum amount can be built on the site. So if it's 80,000 square meters maximum. But how much of that is foyer, how much of that is cafeteria, how much of that is podium, how much of that is office, how much, you know. We have to develop it by actually doing the work. And so uh, I didn't focus on the facades because that would be like a whole, a whole other kind of lecture. Uh, but it's a big struggle because what we tend to do is we have, a, we have an office in Shanghai, we have an office in Melbourne, we have the office in London, and the office in Delhi now. And on the Chinese projects, we usually were asked to do at least two options to submit to the client. But we also usually do each office. So the office in Shanghai will usually do four options. And we'll do four options in Melbourne. And try to do those within the first week or so. And then look at those. And again, like at the very beginning, when I was showing the, the little twisted Filaments. We'll try to compare and do a kind of comparative uh, analysis of why this one versus this one, why this form, why this massing versus this one, why this facade, what is it doing for us, and so on and so forth, under, under a lot of different criteria. And then submit two of those to the client, and they may pick one up. They may throw them both out and ask us to do some more. But I mean, again, we, we still work fairly iterative. So, uh, a lot of the different trajectories that the facades go come out of having taken some developmental uh, uh, direction with some way, you know, whether it's folded facade, whether it's offset of building, uh, whether it's different sort of textural conditions. Some of it has to do with environmental, but not always. Some of it has to do with knowing, I mean, the client will tell us what system they're going to use and then we have a limited range of which we can do. We've worked on you know, probably 250 projects in China, and we've never been given a budget on a project. Not because there's no budget. They just don't tell us what anything costs. We draw something, and they say, well, we can't afford that. Draw it again. And then you, the, the, the project in Beijing, which was our first project, when it got to the stage of actually specifying the facades, and some of the interiors. They took us to a huge warehouse in Beijing. And you walk down the aisle, and you see some tiles, and you go, oh, those are nice tiles. And they say, no, you can't afford that. And you just keep walking, and you see some more, and you go, well, those are not bad. And they go, yeah, we can afford those. And the same with the facade. So it's not cost planning. It's not like, well, it's got to be within this range. Here's the system. It's really imaging what it will be, and then try and figure out how to achieve so the, you know, I mean, what we try to do is a certain amount, I mean, I don't call it real research, but it's just constantly trying to 
you know, we, we try to take on different projects, try to categorize what we've done and what didn't work, and then readdress it on other projects and rethink it in a slightly different way. Uh, but it's a, you know, particularly the, the commercial work uh, in China, whether it's with a developer or with a government agency, is very much image driven. Uh, when I was telling Hatoshi uh, that, you know, uh, you know, with private developers it's one thing, with government developers it's another, and at the end of the day it usually comes down to the mayor making a decision. So you do a competition, you win the competition, and then the mayor has to decide if yours is the one that gets built or another one. So it's very much about the kind of image that they feel is powerful or strong or something. Yeah. I've always appreciated your waterfront projects or city edge projects. You guys have always seen very good at those. How is it being in a vacuum versus being in a context? A vacuum in terms of not having a brief, not having... Well, not having a context, like in the project in Dubai or maybe the Soto Group project. seems like there were context plans that developed around it, but how is it working in rapidly developing context versus saying over oh, oh right well okay you know I mean a lot of I mean the one thing I didn't show any of and, and, and it probably 50% of our work in the last five years has been master plans urban <laughs> master plans. Um, and uh, a lot of those like for instance the, the the project that was the council building with the hotel that was a project that fit within a master plan that we had designed, which was on a totally empty site. I mean, empty. It was farmland. Uh, and so the master, it was a totally new town. There were no, not even a village there. It was all farmland and light industrial land that was being taken over, being rehabilitated. It's on the top of the lake. And uh, there was a lot of uh, industrial runoff and pollution. And as part of the, the government in Australia, there was a, a kind of cooperative arrangement where we provided expertise on how to clean up the water, and in so doing, uh, make the lake much more attractive, and in so doing, raise the value of the land, and in so doing, make it feasible then to develop this new town on the edge of this lake. So the master plan was feeding into all of that to develop a kind of scenario for what the city, what this new town might be. And then the building commission came after that. So it's kind of like the, the, the context in a lot of these is constructed out of the master planning process, which might be, I mean, we did one in Nanjing for 250 hectare redevelopment on the Yangtze River, right in almost the oldest part of Nanjing, uh, which was industrial and port and all kinds of stuff. And so there is an existing context. It's about how much of that remains in terms of its underlying infrastructure as well as some structures. But a lot of it is really very bad construction and very bad arrangements. And so it's kind of mixing into that. But also, you know, they were looking at this as a very big, both from the government's point of view, the Nanjing Urban Planning Bureau, but also a developer who have the rights to develop two thirds of it. And so, you know, the context in a lot of cases is, to a certain degree, is constructed. But it's constructed in many of these as a process of, of a redevelopment. Uh, it's already been undertaken. So, so the tower, the tower that had the kind of crenellated side, which is in Tianjin, is in a new area called Bin Hai. It used to be the port area, and it's a massive redevelopment. And you know, when we won the competition, I think there were maybe six towers around it that were either under construction or recently completed. Now there's 34 towers completed in three years. So in some sense you're right, there is no context, but the context is constantly <coughs> there as part of an overall plan that's, that's already been initiated in those places. Um, now that you have a track record in China and you've built uh, several buildings there, you get a sense that things are changing, that uh, beyond the image making, beyond simply a marketing image, that 
significant number of people are becoming aware of the added value of architecture and that if you build it better, it's going to last longer in the long run, that will actually save money rather than throwing it up and having it essentially collapse for a few years. Um, are you optimistic in that regard? Well, it's, I mean, you have to, I think you have to think of China as a, an ongoing sequences of, of development. Uh, so in the, the, the one-tier cities, the, you know, Shanghai, <coughs> Beijing, uh, Guangzhou, big places, Tianjin is a one-tier city. Some of that's happening. And I think there are areas where, in terms of both the urban design and uh, civic spaces, as well as the building, Certainly, the quality has gone up tremendously. Uh, you know, China, I mean, most of the work we were doing in Dubai was being sourced from China in terms of glass and facades and so forth because they have the most modern plants in the world. You know, so the highest quality, some of the highest quality glass that's being produced in China is they've got very newest plants. So in one sense, quality is going up, but what's happening is that this scale of development is just radiating, not just from the center, but in other centers. I mean, we we have an office in Shanghai, and we've never, I mean, we've done a couple of competitions, but we've never done a project in Shanghai. Most of our work is in second-tier cities like Nanjing, or third-tier cities like Changzhou, or fourth-tier cities like Wujian, or others. And a fourth-tier city is only a million people. So, you know, uh, Tier one city is anything from 15 to 30 million. Uh, tier two city is anything from 10 to 20. Uh, tier three is anything from three to eight. And tier one is anything from a million to two million. So we haven't even worked in fourth, fifth tier cities, uh, which would be bigger than any, you know, mm -hmm. most places. But what it means is that some of those same problems are just gravitating down the line. So, uh, both from the developer's point of view and from the, you know, again, the mayors. So you get mayors, I mean, we're, we're doing a project right now in a, in a small town of about a million people. Uh, and it's basically just the mayor saying he wants to have a really nice library there. But, you know, they wanted an image within two days of telling us we had been commissioned to do something. We said, well, could we just actually develop it? And say, yeah, but the mayor wants to see something so he can look at it. So it, it's, it's very difficult, very difficult. And, you know, in China, like the experience we had in Dubai, is that in economies that are <coughs> rapidly changing, it's not, one of the other conditions is that you have people who two weeks ago made all their money selling perfume and now are building a 40-story building because they made enough money to get the loan, to buy the land, to build the 40-story. So as a client, they're, they have no experience with development whatsoever. Whereas there are also then developers like Soho who have been doing this for 15 or 20 years now, and they understand a lot about what it means. And therefore, simultaneously, you can have one client that's actually, it's not a difference of who's the better client. Sometimes the inexperienced one is actually easier to work with. But in terms of the outcome and the expectation and the way they understand things is radically different. So you have very, very inexperienced clients who are actually doing very major 